Okay, well, first off, uh, thank you very much for, for coming out today. Uh, I recognize many people in the audience, and you are mathematicians. There are, hopefully there are non-mathematicians in the audience. Yes? Are there some non-mathematicians? Because this is, this is a general audience talk, okay? So the mathematicians have probably not learned very much. The non-mathematicians hopefully will learn something. Um, but um, those are the slides I have, so I will continue. So the, um, um, the first thing that I want to do, and you can see that this, well, let me actually say, um, I've given this talk one time before. I gave it at a small college. It was to the, the entire small college, mathematicians, scientists, literature, humanities, you know, the entire. And so it, and it was close to my hometown, and my mom came to my talk. <laughs> and so I, I structured the talk so that my mother could understand. Okay, So that's the level that I'm aiming for. I'm trying to give my mom a, a, a sense of what I do. Okay, All right. So symmetry and abstraction. So the very first slide is about what mathematicians do, because this is very mysterious. As you, If you're a mathematician, you know the general public does not have any idea what we do. Right? So here's something about what mathematicians do. It's difficult to describe to a non-mathematician what we do because the things that we study and the way that we look at things are very far from everyday life, typically. Um, concretely, if you come to my office in California, I have toys. I have colored chalk and I have books. And what I do is I spend a lot of time staring at things, I draw pictures, and I figure things out. And in general, mathematicians study structure in the abstract and what this talk is designed to do is to try and get you, the audience, the non-mathematicians, to understand what structure in the abstract is. Because most non-mathematicians think of mathematics as about numbers. And so I'm very specifically trying to give a talk with very few numbers and about structure in the abstract. They systematically try to ignore the details and look at underlying patterns. And at the end, the original objects disappear and you only see the patterns and in fact, if you know, the, there's a children's story, um, Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland has a character called the Cheshire Cat. And the Cheshire Cat disappears. And when the Cheshire Cat disappears, everything but the smile disappears. And you just see the smile for a while, and then the smile disappears. And so I sort of say that mathematics is kind of like the Cheshire Cat, that the details go away, and all you see is the smile, the sort of heart of the picture. And so this is to give you a sense of what they do. Here's the outline. The, the topic, we'll first talk about what a symmetry is. Then I'll talk about repeating horizontal patterns called freeze patterns. Then I'll talk about wallpaper patterns. And then, abs then some applications at the end. And I should note that none of the pictures in here are due to me. Uh, none of the photographs. I pulled them all off the web. This one is of Jogesa in, in Seoul. And it's by someone named David Kennard. And I just found it online. Okay, um, But I think it's a very pretty picture, and I want to use it to talk about what symmetry means. Right? And so here's two pictures, and the question that I want you to ask yourself is, are they the same, or are they different? Right? Basic question. Are they the same picture, or are they different pictures? And I think that we can all agree that the answer depends on what you pay attention to. That if you say, if you're only looking at the shape, yeah, the, the, that's a rectangle, that's a rectangle. They're the same, right? Or if you're looking at the colors, this has blues and greens and yellows and reds. This has blues and greens and yellows and reds. They're the same, right? But if you look closely, if you look at the details, then you would say, no, they're different, right? This one looks like the mirror image of the other one. And so the notion of asymmetry has to do with this idea of things being the same. This is the quiz. So if you're a mathematician in the audience, this slide has a quiz for you. Okay? The mathematicians are going to be quizzed on this slide. So um, one more thing from the US. There's a children's game in the US called One of These Things is Not Like the Others. And basically, you, you list four things. And then the goal of the game is to find something to pay attention to so that three are the same and one is different. Okay, so you try to find you try to find something to pay attention to, so that three are the same and one is different. And so for the mathematicians, here are four things: <laughs> rock, tree, field, quaternion. Which one is different? Rock. 
This one is different. <laughs> right? Why? Because tree is the name of a mathematical object. Field is the name of a mathematical object. Quaternion is the name of a mathematical object. And I, in this, I'm mistaken, I do not know of any mathematical object called rock. Nobody has defined a rock in mathematics. Um, and th so the answer is rock. And there's actually a story that goes with this. Um, this was told to me by a friend of mine. She was, she's a mathematician, and she was on a train, and she was reading a book. And it was a Springer book, and so it was yellow, and it was clear that it was a mathematics book. And it's by Jean-Pierre Serre, and it's a book called Trees. Okay? <laughs> it's a book called Trees. And she was sitting across from another mathematician. And the other mathematician looked at the book, could see it was a mathematics book, saw the title, and said very loudly, what is a tree? And everybody in the train turned to stare at this person who didn't know basic English. <laughs> How can you know English and not know what a tree is? But they were asking a mathematical question. OK. So symmetry. So symmetry is this idea of having two different notions of being similar at the same time. You have sort of a rough version and a fine version. So at the large scale, if you only pay attention to the shape, if you only pay attention to the colors, these look the same. If you look at the details, they look different. And so that's a symmetry of the object. If I take something like this and I rotate it, it looks the same unless I actually had nice numbers on the, on the vertices. If I had numbers or colors on the vertices and the edges, then this would look different. Right? If I had extra features that told me. And so symmetry is about transformations of situations that roughly look the same but at, a, at, a, at, a diff, on a, at, a, at the same time, they look different. And so I have one with colors. And so here, if you're only paying attention to the shape, that looks the same. But if you're paying attention to the colors, it looks different. And so that's a symmetry of the object. It's a non-trivial symmetry to, to rotate it like that. And the thing that you can do with symmetries is that you can multiply them. And so you can think about this symmetry as the action of rotating the, the, the tetrahedron and this symmetry. And then you could try multiplying them. You could say, well, start like this, and you could rotate, rotate. And that started from some position and got to a different position. And so you could write out a big multiplication table of all the possible symmetries. And so if you do this one followed by that one, then here's the answer. And so you can start talking about the algebra of the symmetries of an object. Uh, this particular one, I think this is my next slide, has that if you look at a tetrahedron in space, uh, this is an image that I got from Wikipedia, that if you look at a tetrahedron and you give it some colors, the vertices have colors, the sides have colors, then there, if you limit yourself to what you can, how you can move it around in space, there are exactly 12 different motions that you can make. You can move it along. Uh, the one up here, the one down here, is, let's see, so the red side says, let me try and do this. So the red side, if this is the red side, the red side says fixed, and so it's probably that one. Right? And if I do it more than once, then I get to something different, and if I do it a third time, then I get back to the start. Right? And so that's what this loop represents. But rather than rotating it around this vertex, I can rotate it around this vertex. And that's one of the other ones. Or I can rotate around this vertex or I could rotate around the top. What about the ones up here? I'm going over and coming back. That's something like this. But if I rotate sort of the midpoints around the midpoints of the edges, when I do it once, I get something different. But when I do it twice, I get back. Right? And so that's going up there. And then if we wanted, we could give names to all 12 of these motions and then write out a big 12 by 12 table. Right? No numbers, but there's still multiplication. There's still ways of composing things. And you could talk about, well, this motion has an inverse, which is that motion. It undoes it. And so you can start having multiplication tables, algebraic structure. And a quick comment about mathematical language. Um, as we saw on the earlier slide, um, language that mathematicians use is going to cause problems. It always causes problems, no matter what. Because what are we doing? We're trying to describe unfamiliar concepts. 
And so we have two choices. We can either use a familiar word, right, for an unfamiliar concept like group, ring, field, tree, building, category. But then we're using an ordinary word in a strange way. Or we could use unfamiliar words. Quaternion, functor, topological space, homeomorphism, cohomology. Those are clearly not ordinary things, but it still doesn't help. People don't understand these, and they don't understand these. Right? Because we're trying to, under we're trying to describe unfamiliar concepts. And so that's in preparation for the notion of symmetries of an object and the multiplication table that you can write down. That, that idea, the collection of all transformations that have, a multi that have this multiplication structure with a few properties, that collection of symmetries is called a group. But I'm using it in a technical sense. It means that it's, it's, it's this collection of symmetries and they've got certain properties. Any motion can be undone, and you can compose any two motions. Okay, And then you get a collection of things that we'll say is a group. Not just a group of people, but a group meaning it's a mathematical object with very specific structural properties. OK? All right. So um, let me now switch to the first topic. Um, and that is that how does a mathematician look at repeating horizontal patterns? Sort of like this horizontal pattern, or here's a whole bunch of horizontal patterns, again, taken from the internet. And if I ask you how many different repeating patterns there are, you would probably say there are uncountably many. There are as many repeating patterns as you want, unless all you're looking at is the structure. If you're only looking at the structure, if you're only looking at the symmetries, then the number is much, much smaller. So what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you some examples. Um, here's a nice repeating pattern. Okay. And what I want to do is I want to take that original pattern, and I want to try taking it and flipping it over end over end. I want to try flipping it horizontally. And it looks different. Right? Um, we could also try taking the original pattern and flipping it vertically. Um, one thing I found when I tried this talk on, on my mom beforehand is that originally I only had one picture. I said, imagine flipping it. That's very difficult for some people. <laughs> <laughs> and so I actually put in the different images. That helped a lot. So um, we can flip it vertically. It looks different. right? And then the last one is we could take it and we could rotate it which is the same as flipping it vertically and flipping it horizontally. And it also looks different. Right? So this one doesn't really have any kind of symmetries other than that it looks the same side by side. Let's do a slightly different one. So now this one, if we flip it horizontally, it looks different. But if we flip it vertically, you can probably already see it's going to look the same. One thing that I should say is that in the code in the, to produce the slides, I didn't actually just copy the picture. I actually told it to flip the picture over. It really is flipped over. <laughs> okay? It's vertically flipped. This one really is rotated. Okay? It just it has a symmetry, and so when you flip it over, it looks the same. Right? And then that one is rotated. And so what you see is that these two look the same. These two look the same, but these look different. And so we could go ahead and say that this has a vertical symmetry, has a top-bottom symmetry. And if you think of this as being written on a piece of paper, if I folded the paper, the top half and the bottom half would match. Right? Okay. Um, here's another one that um, we can go through these a little bit faster, but we can flip it horizontally. Looks the same. Vertically, looks different. Rotated, looks different. And so this one has a horizontal symmetry, sort of a left-right symmetry. Looks the same whether I look at it this way or this way. Um, another one. And hopefully you can start guessing how these are going. Horizontally, it looks different. When you flip it vertically, it also looks different. But this one is, is set up so that when you rotate it, it looks the same. Right? So this one has a rotational symmetry. 
This one has a rotational symmetry. Okay, so uh, one more. Oh yeah, this one. We could flip it horizontally. Looks the same. We could flip it vertically. Looks the same. And we could rotate it. Now it looks the same. Okay, so at the moment, we have seen at least five different types of patterns. There was the original pattern that had no symmetries. There was a second pattern that had a vertical symmetry, but that was it. There was a third pattern that had a horizontal symmetry, but that was it. There was a fourth pattern that had a rotational symmetry, but that was it. And then there was a fifth pattern that has vertical symmetry, horizontal symmetry, and rotational symmetry. Okay, so here they are. Um, no extra symmetries, top-bottom symmetry, left-right symmetry, rotational symmetries, and top-bottom, left-right, and rotational symmetries. Okay? So far so good? Okay. Um, there's two more patterns that you can have. One like this, and I went ahead and just put all four of them up at once. It doesn't quite have vertical symmetry. Right? I mean, the top, if I took it as a piece of paper and I folded it, the top and the bottom don't quite match up. If I cut the paper, the top and the bottom look the same. But in order to make them match up, I would need to fold it and slide. Right? So in order to get the top to look like, in order to make the pattern look the same, I would have to flip it over and slide it a little bit. So this is called a glide rotation or glide reflection, and it's a special type of symmetry. And then here's a seventh pattern that um, if I reflect through one of these peaks, you can see that it has left-right symmetry. If I try to fold it down the middle, it doesn't quite match up, but it has the sort of glide rotation symmetry. Um, if I rotate very carefully, if I put my finger here and spin it around, then it has rotational symmetry. But if I put my finger someplace else and rotate, you know, only at these crossing points does it have rotational symmetry. When you rotate, you have a fixed point. So, what do I want to do with these? What I want to do is that if you give me an arbitrary repeating horizontal pattern, then what I want to do is I want to get colored chalk, and I'm going to mark on the pattern. Okay? And what I want to do is that I'm going to draw a nice red line anytime you can fold and have the two sides match up. And so if there's a vertical symmetry, one that looks like the same top and bottom, I'm going to draw a red line right through the middle, at the place where you fold. If there's a left, if there's a left right symmetry, I'm going to draw a vertical line where you could fold the two halves of the paper and make them match up. So anywhere there's a place where you could fold, I'm going to draw a red line. Okay? Um, I'm going to draw a blue dot if that point can be fixed, and then you can just spin the picture and have it look the same. Okay? I'm going to draw a green line. That's supposed to be green. A dashed green line if you can flip it and slide it the sort of glide reflection, okay? And then after I've drawn the red lines, the blue dots, and the green dashed lines, I want to forget the rest of the picture, okay? So here it is with our seven patterns. Um, no symmetries, no green lines, no red lines, no blue dots. This one um, had a glide, rotation, or glide reflection. So there's a green line going down the middle. This one has a nice reflection symmetry, top-bottom symmetry, so I'm going to draw a nice solid red line. In this one, I can reflect through here, I can reflect through here, I can reflect through here. There's lots of different places where I could fold the paper to get the two halves to match up, and so I'm going to draw lots of red lines. Here, um, there's no red lines. There's no places where I could fold the paper and have it match. But there are plenty of places where I could put a blue dot and spin the paper and have it match. If I, put a, if, I, if I put my finger there and I spin it, it would match up. If I put my finger halfway in between and spin the paper, it would match up. And so I've got blue dots, lots of blue dots. Okay? And then these two have lots of symmetries and so you see lots in the pictures. There's a dashed green line, there's vertical red lines, and there's blue dots. And then down here, we've got a red line, and we've got lots of red lines. And actually, I probably should have, when you have the two red lines cross, um, if, you, if you 
flip a page over like this and then flip it like that, it's as if you rotated it. And so all the places where they're crossing, I really should have put blue dots. Okay? And then over here, I forgot the original pattern I just wrote down the colored chalk. Okay? And the claim is that if you take absolutely any horizontal repeating pattern and you draw on it with chalk representing the symmetries and then you ignore the original pattern, you'll see one of these seven things. Okay? These are the only possible collections of symmetries for horizontal repeating patterns. Is the statement clear at least? There's only seven possible patterns. That if, that if I take any repeating pattern, a, a nice horizontal repeating pattern, and I draw on it, and I only pay attention to the colored chalk, I'm going to see one of these seven pictures. Okay? I'm not going to give you the proof of that, but that actually is a theorem. And so it's in this sense that you could say that there are only seven ways to repeat in a horizontal strip. Okay? There are only seven ways to repeat things horizontally. Um, and I think you might actually be able to guess where I'm going with this next. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to do the same thing, only instead of talking about horizontal re repetitions, we're now going to talk about wallpaper. And so there should be some small image that's repeated all over the wallpaper. And so if you have nice repetitive wallpaper, some image reflected all over the place, then and the image you may have something, it doesn't matter what the image is. It might be a flower pointing this way, and then a flower pointing that way, and then a flower pointing this way. But then you can do the exact same thing. You can say, is there a place where I could draw a line and fold the two halves? Is there a point where I could rotate the picture and have it look the same? And we actually need to be a little bit more careful now because it could be that I could put my finger on a spot and rotate the picture, and maybe I could rotate it just 30 degrees and have it look the same. Or maybe I need to rotate it 90 degrees. I might be able to rotate it different amounts depending on where I put my finger. And so we're going to need to keep track of that as well. But essentially, the result that was part of the title of the talk is this theorem that was proved back in 1924 that if you take any repeating pattern of wallpaper and you mark on it, I mean, you, you can do this at home if you want. If you go home and you mark on your wall <laughs> using crayons, using colored chalk, and then you only look at the colored chalk, you will see one of 17 particular patterns. Okay? And so it's in that sense that there are only 17 types of wallpaper. There are only 17 patterns of places where you can reflect, where you can rotate, where you can do glide reflections. And um, the next slide is actually going to list them for you. Uh, the, the, the conventions are slightly different because uh, the earlier ones I made myself, the ones on the next slide I took from, from Wikipedia. And so these are the 17 types of wallpaper. But let me try and explain what the different things are. They, they use different conventions. And so when you see a blue line, that's where you can fold. Okay? Blue line means you can fold the two halves. And so whatever is down here, because there's a, a blue line between, it's mirror images up here. Okay? Um, when you see these, uh, blue, these, these red diamonds, that means that there's a 180 rotation around them. You're supposed to think of this as having only two corners, and so it's a one-half rotation. Do a one-half rotation, then this will move up to there. Um, let's go down to something like this. This one has lots of foldings. So, so um, that's a blue line, so this triangle looks the same as that triangle, flipped over. This is a blue line, so that looks the same as that. Looks the same as this, flipped over. Um, this is a green square, which means that I can do a one-fourth rotation, and it looks the same. Okay, um, so the, the red diamonds mean a one-half rotation and it looks the same. Green squares mean a one-fourth rotation. Um, what would you guess that a red triangle means? What would it work? One, let's see, so square was a one-fourth. Something with two corners that was a one-half. So a triangle? One-third. One-third. 
And then, you probably can't make this up, but that's a hexagon. Okay? That's a hexagon. That's a hexagon, and so a one-sixth rotation. One-sixth rotation there. Um, and the, some of these are, this is a dashed black line. That means that it's supposed to be a glide rotation. So you flip it over and slide, and it looks the same. Okay? All right. So this is the claim, that, that if you take any repeating pattern of wallpaper and you mark on it by the places where there's rotations, the places where there's reflections, the places where there are glide rotations, by drawing the dashed lines, the solid lines, the one-half, the one-third, one one-fourth, one-sixth rotations, you'll get one of these one of these 17 patterns. Okay? All right, like I said, I'm not actually going to talk about the proof, but the proof's not that bad. Um, um, if this was to a math club, I would probably give the proof. But as a general audience talk, I just want to make sure the statement's understood. Because this is an example of something that I think is um, interesting mathematics, no numbers, but it's sort of getting at the heart of the structure to things, and we're trying to see what the structure is. Okay? All right. Um, oh, here's the conventions that I just said. I sort of went over these already. Um, reflections are these blue lines where you can fold. Glide reflections dash black lines. The rotations are indicated by the smallest possible rotation to have it look the same. One half, one third, one fourth, one sixth. And then, I didn't mention this, but the darker area is the part that you need to fill in. And so you tell me what this looks like. Let's do one here. If you tell me what's inside the triangle, then because of the way everything's listed, I can tell you what the rest of the wallpaper looks like. If you tell me that there's these rotations, these glide reflections, these rot et cetera. If you give me all the annotations and you tell me what's in this triangle, I can, com I can complete the rest of the wallpaper. Similarly down here, if you tell me what's in this triangle and you tell me that this is the pattern, then I can, I can fill in the rest of the wallpaper. Okay? All right. I'm talking a little bit fast. Um, we're already up to the applications. So um, let me just mention um, a couple of, of ways that this kind of idea is useful. This is not just something where mathematicians are looking at their wallpaper and drawing. It actually is useful. And so the first application that I want to mention is probably the most closely related to what I've talked about. And that is that in the same way that you can talk about repeating horizontal patterns, and you can talk about repeating wallpaper patterns, you can talk about repeating three-dimensional patterns. Right? And when you talk about repeating three-dimensional patterns, now you can, be st you can start talking about atomic structure. You can start talking about crystals. And one thing that some chemists learned back in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, is that when they analyzed the structure of crystals and they ignored which atoms were there, they only paid attention to the structure of the crystals. Where are the reflections? Where are the rotations? And sort of the annotations that we did with the wallpaper. If you do the same thing, oh, I should mention, there were seven patterns of horizontal strips, 17 patterns of wallpaper, 230 patterns in space. Okay? Each one described by a group and how the group is acting on space by this algebraic structure. Um, it turns out that if you have a, a, a crystal, a nice chemical crystal, and you, you know all the details of the atomic structure, but you don't tell me the atomic structure. All you tell me is the symmetries of the atomic structure. Just knowing the symmetries allows me to predict some of its chemical properties. The symmetries of the crystal predicts some of the, the properties of the chemistry, which is sort of very interesting. Nothing about the atoms, just the symmetry of the atoms tells you about the chemi chemical properties. And this is a quote from um, Eric Weinstein's World of Chemistry. He says that this, this, this field is called crystal field theory. It was developed by Hans Bethe in 1929 by applying group theory, right? group theory, Applying group theory and some quantum mechanics to electrostatic theory, it was further developed by physicists in the 1930s and 40s. It can be used to predict chemical properties 
uh, kinetic properties, reaction mechanisms, magnetic and spectral properties, and thermodynamic data just from knowing the crystal structure. And they got the Nobel Prize. Han Beta got the Nobel Prize for doing this. And there were a couple others as well that got Nobel Prizes for doing this. It was sort of a very interesting application of some mathematics that wasn't developed for chemistry. The mathematics was developed you know, 30, 40 years earlier, partly because mathematicians were just staring at things. And they were playing with their toys, and they were analyzing how things work. And they understood the abstract structure of patterns. And once they had that abstract structure, somebody came along and applied it to chemistry and got interesting results. Right? And this is sort of the way that pure mathematics is supposed to work. You develop the mathematics ahead of time because somebody might need it at some point, more often than you'd think. Um, the second application that I want to mention is that um, this notion of a symmetry actually is very, um, not the sort of symmetries I've been talking about, but sort of continuous symmetries. If instead of thinking of a tetrahedron, if you imagine that I had a nice round sphere in front of me, then there's a whole family of symmetries where I could just slowly rotate. All of these are symmetries. And so I have a whole continuous set of symmetries rather than just sort of this, this, discrete symmetries. And uh, Emmy Noter, who was a German mathematician around 1900, um, she basically, she proved a theorem, but it has a nice informal statement that says that if you have a continuous symmetry of a physical theory, then there should be something that's conserved. That if you have, if you have a physical theory, if you have a theory of how things work, and the equations that describe how this works, there's some symmetry to the equations. That the equations look the same when you view them this way as when you view them that way. Um, if there's a symmetry to the equations, then there should be something that is a conserved quantity. And so when you think about all the things that you learn in physics, like conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum, what those are really saying is that the underlying symmetry of the equa that, that the underlying equations have a symmetry. And it's because of the underlying symmetry of the equations that there is conservation of mass, that there is conservation of momentum. That, that any time things are conserved in the, in the physics, it's because the equations are symmetric. That there's sort of this nice correspondence between symmetries of the equations, conservation of something. That's sort of a new statement of Emmy Noether's theorem in physics. Okay? And so group theory also plays a role in physics because um, you try and this, and so one, yeah, so what, and so there's this back and forth between conserved things, which is the way that you observe stuff, what you, what you talk about, but then when you start to do theoretical physics, you convert those conservation laws into symmetries of equations. And you end up studying the groups that are the symmetry groups of your equations. I guess one thing that I should add here is that, um, that I started out with something nice and simple. You have a nice physical object in front of you, and then we talk about the symmetries of the physical object. But once you have the idea of symmetries, of transformations that, that make things roughly look the same, but it, when you look closer, you see changes, once you have the notion of symmetry and you have the notion that symmetries compose and give you a nice algebraic structure, then you find symmetries everywhere. And so for any object, particularly mathematical objects, if it's an equation, you can talk about symmetries of equations. If it's a category, you can talk about symmetries of categories. If it's a, you know, every mathematical object, you can talk about symmetries. And so the groups, the structures, the algebraic structures that, that come from looking at how symmetries compose show up all throughout mathematics. They show up all throughout um, applications of mathematics. And in physics, they're, they're the thing that corresponds to conservation laws. That's the rough statement that I want to say from this slide. And like I said, I'm talking a little faster than I did in the past, so I'm going to finish soon. But I have one more thing to say. Again, this is for the non-mathematicians. And that is, first off, uh, just to introduce a little bit about my field, um, I'm a geometric group theorist. And what that means is that I study groups of symmetries. 
of mathematical objects. The objects that I typically study, they're usually um, infinite things in high dimensional spaces um, using geometric techniques. And then I study their symmetries and I try to understand how they compose. And I try to get at what's going on. Um, the field um, of geometric group theory and its basic tools are actually fairly new. They were only created in the 1980s. And so they're about you know, 25, 30 years old at this point. Um, uh, I was in grad school in the late 80s, early 90s, and so it was a brand new field when I was studying. Um, at the moment, there are about 300 to 400 researchers around the world that do geometric group theory research. And the final thing is, this is specifically for the non-mathematicians, but um, um, actually let me, let me tell you a story since I have a little time. Um, at one point, um, back many years ago, before I came to Santa Barbara, I was at a party with some other faculty members. Faculty members from other de departments. And, um, and we were talking about having undergraduates do research. And somebody from the English department was saying, well, you can't have a mathematician do undergraduate research because there's no new math to discover. Math is done. <laughs> he, thought that there, he, he thought there were new things to say about Shakespeare, <laughs> but nothing new to say about mathematics. And so for anybody who has that idea, mathematics is incredibly active. That if you've ever looked online to see about, um, here's just some rough ideas. Uh, mathematicians around the world publish about 90,000 papers, new results, every year. 90,000. Um, nobody reads them all. <laughs> right? Um, you typically try to find your one little area and keep current in your one little area. But 90,000 papers a year. Um, and each of those papers is publishing something new and finding out something more about the structure of structure and the abstract. Um, it's a basic science that strongly impacts all the other sciences um, in one way or another. Um, and the other sciences are the ones that strongly impact daily life. The, the mathematics is behind it, sort of in the background, doing the basic research, trying to get a feel for what the structure is ahead of time so that the results are ready when, when the applied scientists need them. Right? This is what mathematicians do. Thank you. <laughs>